rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world, and then shall the end come. Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Here's today's prophecy update. France, Germany, and Italy are meeting today to plan for the future of the European Union after Great Britain makes its, ex its exit. Germany is concerned with assuring that the remaining 27 members stay in the EU. There are rumblings that the Netherlands, one of the founding members of the European Union, may be considering following Great Britain out of the Union. This meeting being held today is important to the fulfillment of Bible prophecy because the scriptures foretell that the Antichrist and the false prophet will both emerge from somewhere in Europe. The prophecies also say that a 10 nation alliance will ultimately give birth to the Antichrist. This may indicate that there is more upheaval yet to come for the European Union. Well, interesting things indeed, just as an aside, it may interest all of you to know that this island was chosen today for them to meet on. It's called Ventonini Island, just off of Italy. And it was chosen because one of the EU's founding fathers, a man by the name of Mr. Spinelli, wrote a manifesto to create a federal Europe while he was imprisoned on the island during the Second World War. So he wrote this concept of a politically united Europe. So they're going there today, hoping to preserve the future for a politically united Europe none other than the rebirth of the Holy Roman Empire, which is what it is right now. Now, why is that so important? Because the Bible specifically prophesies the Antichrist and the false prophet will come out of the reborn Holy Roman Empire. Well, they're there today to save the empire in the wake of Britain's decision to withdraw from the European Union. That happened on June the 23rd. Well, uh, that's not what we're going to spend our time on today, however. I want to go with you to scriptures in the Bible, in the book of Revelation, that talk about events to come. There are three main sections to the book of Revelation. There are seven seals, there are seven trumpets, and there are seven vials. Now, one of the big keys to understanding the seals, the trumpets, and the vials is to understand that the seventh seal and the seventh trumpet and the seventh vial is the exact same event. The seals are the long story ending at the seventh seal. The trumpets are the shorter story ending at the seventh trumpet. And the vials are the real short story ending at the seventh vial. But I want to show you today a key to Revelation because many people think the book of Revelation is in order from chapter 1 through chapter number 22. If you believe that, you'll be so confused. By the time you get to the end, you won't understand anything that's going on. Let me give you absolute proof right now that the seventh seal, the seventh trumpet, and the seventh vial is the exact same thing. The seventh seal is described in Revelation chapter 8, verse 5. Here's what it says. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. Now watch what happened. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. The seventh trumpet is recorded in Revelation eleven nineteen. 19. Here's what it says. 
And the temple of God was opened in heaven and there was seen in his temple, the ark of his testament. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. Wow. Sounds like the same thing, doesn't it? Let's now look at the seventh vial. The seventh vial is found in verse 18 of the 16th chapter of Revelation. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings and a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth so mighty an earthquake and so great. So in all three places, we see the same thing. Voices, thunderings, lightnings, earthquake. Voices, thunderings, lightnings, earthquake. Voices, thunderings, lightnings, earthquake. There's no doubt about it that the seventh seal, the seventh trumpet, and the seventh vial is all the same thing. They all three happen at the battle of Armageddon. They all three happen at the second coming of Jesus Christ. So the seals starting in verse number four through verse five of chapter eight, that's the seven seals. And then the seven trumpets begin in chapter eight, verse six, and the seven trumpets culminate in chapter 11, verse 19. They tell the story again, culminating in Armageddon. And then the vials began in chapter number 16. And chapter number 16, again, tells the same story of the seven vials. And they culminate in verse number 18 with the very same words. Now that's a big, huge key. We're not gonna go any deeper into that, but I wanna talk about the seals today. It's been a long time since I've talked to you about the seven seals, but it's really important to understand what's going on in our world right now because these seals are affecting the world as we know it. We're gonna go now to Revelation chapter six, verse one through eight. I'm reading from the King James Version, but in verse number one, it starts telling us about the seals and I saw when the lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard as it were the noise of thunder. One of the four beasts saying, come and see. And I saw and behold a white horse. And he that sat on him had a bow and a crown was given unto him. And he went forth conquering and to conquer. Okay, now let's pause. So the first thing John saw was a white horse with a rider. The rider had a bow, no arrows, and a crown was given to him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Hmm, wonder what that means. Then verse number three tells us about the second seal. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, come and see. And there went out another horse, but this horse was red and power was given to him that set on the red horse to take peace from the earth and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword, quite different from the white horse rider. Verse five, and when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, come and see. And behold, I, and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, a measure of wheat for a penny, three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou, don't hurt the oil and the wine. Hmm. Verse seven, and when it opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, come and see. And I looked and behold a pale horse and his name that set on him was death and hell followed with him and power was given unto him over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword and with hunger and with death and with the beast of the earth. What in the world is all this about? Now this is in the Holy Scriptures. This is there for us to learn. But at first it makes no sense to us. I remember many years ago 
when I was attempting to decipher all of this, to learn what these prophecies actually mean, I noticed that there was another account of this prophecy in the Old Testament. Of course, the Re book of Revelation is in the New Testament. But in the book of Zechariah, the same prophecy is found. And it's interesting that the prophecy is recorded in Revelation chapter 6, verse 1 through 8. And in the book of Zechariah, it's recorded in chapter 6, verse 1 through 8. Same chapter, same verses. I have found in my study of Bible prophecy that many times that's a key. If you can find the same prophecy in more than one place in Scripture, sometimes one place will give you things that the other place did not give you. And if you find three different accounts of the prophecy, sometimes you can put it all together and really get a full picture of what it means. And doesn't the Bible say that's the way the Scripture would be given? The Bible says that the Scripture would be given line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little so that only those who diligently seek will find. I mean, you just, if you just read over it and you're not comparing this scripture to that scripture to this scripture, if you're not really doing in-depth study, you'll probably never get it. So let's go now to Zechari Zechariah 6, verse 1 through 8, and listen to the Zechariah account of the four horses. It's the four horses again. And I turned and lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, there came four chariots out from between two mountains, and the mountains were mountains of brass. In the first chariot were red horses. That sounds familiar. And in the second chariot were black horses. Hmm, I remember that too. And in the third chariot, white horses. Okay. And in the fourth chariot, grizzled and bay horses. So look at these horses, they're the same colors. White horse in Revelation 6, white horse in Zechariah 6. Red horse in Revelation 6, red horse in Zechariah 6. Black horse in Zech Revelation 6, black horse in Zechariah chapter number 6. And then a pale horse in Revelation 6, and here it says grizzled and bay horses. We're going to have to talk about that a little bit. However, before we do talk about that, let's read on in Zechariah chapter 6, verse 4. Then I answered and said unto the angel that talked with me, What are these, my Lord? Oh, look at this. He's asking what I, I had on my mind. What are these horses? What are these riders? What's all this about? And the angel answered and said unto me, These are the four spirits of the heavens, which go forth from standing before the Lord of all the earth. Big clue. These are the four spirits. So these horses are spirits. They're not literal horses. They're symbolic of spirits. And then it gives us more information in verse 6. The black horses which are therein go forth into the north country. Now that's interesting. And then the white go after the black into the north country. And the grizzled go forth toward the south country. I wonder what that means. And the bay went forth and sought to go that they might walk to and fro through the earth. And he said, get you hence, walk to and fro through the earth. So they walked to and fro through the earth. Finally, verse 8. Then cried he upon me and spake unto me, saying, Behold, these that go toward the north country have quieted my spirit in the north country. So... The black went into the north country, the white went into the north country, and these that have gone into the north country have quieted my spirit. I wonder what that means. Well, we're going to look at all these things today and find out, in fact, what they do mean. But we're now equipped with a big clue. Let's go back to Revelation chapter 6. Now remember, this is the opening of the first four seals. There was a book with seven seals. And the Lamb, Jesus Christ, opens the seals. 
And the first four of the seals, when they were opened, every time one was opened, a, a horse came out. White, then red, then black, then pale. So these horses are spirits? Now, obviously the colors mean something because the same colors are used in both prophecy and the books were written, what, 600 years apart? So since the prophecies were written 600 years apart and yet they say the same things, this indicates they both have the same author, that God was the author of both books. He merely used different human beings to be his secretary when he wanted to give us this information. So what does God then want us to know? Well, the first thing we want to do is look at the red horse. Now, the reason I'm taking you to the red horse first, even though it was the second horse, is because that's the first one I understood. I'm thinking spirits. What kind of spirits go forth in the world? And one day I stumbled across the information that there is a belief system a spirit that occupies the hearts and the minds of men whose official color is red. I'm sure you've heard of red China, red Russia, red Romania. Back in the days of the Cold War, when communism dominated all of Eastern Europe, all the countries that were under the communist domain, they were known as red countries. Socialism's official color is red. The big flag of uh, Russia is a big red flag. China's flag is red because red is the official color of socialism or communism. Let's see if that fits. Now let's go back and look at Revelation chapter 6, the description of the red horse. It says, And power was given to him that sat on the red horse to take peace from the earth. Has that happened? If you lived through the time of the Cold War, you know it happened because Russia moved into a revolution in North Korea, into Vietnam, into the Congo, and everywhere communism went throughout South America, there was always revolution, took peace from the earth. And then the scripture goes on to say, and that they should kill one another. Now that certainly happened during the Soviet Union when Stalin came to power. Many people believe he killed as high as 60 million in political purges. I think that qualifies for killing one another. So Stalin not only was in World War I and World War II, but now then he's killing many, many people. And then it says there was given unto him a great sword. If you had to name the greatest military powers on earth today, who would you name? China, Russia, the U.S.? Well, China and Russia are both red powers. So there was given unto him a great sword. So that all qualifies. Once I saw that, I thought, well, Lord, if the red horse is communism, then what's these other horses? I noticed the next horse was a black horse. And this horse was described totally different. Didn't have a sword. He didn't take peace from the earth, had a pair of balances in his hand. And this voice said, a measure of wheat for a penny, three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou don't hurt the oil and the wine. I said, Lord, what in the world is that? It was about that time that I was following very carefully the political elections in Germany because Germany has normally dominated the Holy Roman Empire, almost always in the last 1,000 years. And since the Antichrist is going to come out of Europe, I thought maybe the Antichrist would come out of Germany. So I was following the politics to see if there was someone there that might look like the Antichrist to me. Well, as I'm following their elections, what happened was they had two big parties, but then they had a splinter party, a third party. And when the election was held, there were three parties the Democratic Socialist Party, and then the Christian Democratic Party. So the Christian Democrats, they were capitalist, and the Social Democrats were socialist. And then there was other, this other little party that was called the FDP, the Free Democratic People's Party. Well, when the votes were counted, neither of the big parties had a majority. 
so they couldn't form a government. They had to go negotiate with the Free Democratic People's Party, which captured about 7% 7 of the vote. So as they were negotiating for like 30 days, first of all, the Social Democrats voted, negotiated with them and the, Free Demo the Christian Democrats uh, negotiated with them, but they were stuck because the Free Democrats were demanding a lot more than they deserve for their 7% of their contribution to the government. Consequently, the two big parties got sick of it and they slipped around and had a private meeting and they formed what became known as the Grand Coalition. And if my dates are right, on December the 6th of 1966, maybe it was December the 9th, but close, Time Magazine was carrying an article about this. And it said that when the socialists and the Democrats got together, it was a marriage between the red and the black. It was a marriage of convenience, but a stunning match nevertheless. And I looked at that and said, oh my goodness. They're calling the socialists the red power and they're calling the capitalists and democracy the black power. Could it be that black is the official color of capitalism and democracy, just like red is the official color of socialism and communism. You see, socialism is the economic system, cap communism is the political ideology, and in capitalism, capitalism is the economic system, and democracy is the political ideology. So when I look at that, I'm looking at Time Magazine, and I thought, they're using the black for capitalism, just like they use the red, for communism, so I went back to the scriptures and to see if it fits. Why does he have a pair of balances in his hand? Well, balances symbolize trade. So consequently, capitalism, its whole message is trade. And then what's this about a measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny? And see thou, don't hurt the oil and the wine. Is that a prophetic start, stock market report? Dow Jones Industrial's up so much, AT&T down so much, and it's the economy, stupid. Don't hurt the economy. Don't hurt the oil and the wine. And it became so clear to me that these prophecies given 2,000 years ago, Zechariah 2,500 years ago, that they were actually foretelling political ideologies and belief systems that would captivate the hearts and the minds of men even today. When I saw that, I thought, okay, so what's the white horse then? I went back to look at it. And about that time, I stumbled across a book. I actually was in the office of a minister friend of mine. I was traveling, holding meetings, and I went into his office uh, to pray for a while. And I looked over at his bookshelf. He just had a small bookshelf with a few books there. And I noticed one in particular that caught my eye, and it said, uh, communism, democracy, and Catholic power. I thought, communism, democracy, that's two of the horses. Why is Catholic power in this book title? It was not a religious book. It was a political science book written by Paul Blanchard way back when, what, 1948 or something like that. <clears throat> so I borrowed the book and I read it. And I was amazed at what I read because in this book, right in the first chapter, he said, there are three powers that dominate the world. All wars are fought with these three powers. They are communism, democracy, and Catholicism. I never realized that before, but I began to wonder, okay, could Catholicism be the white power? And I noticed that every time I saw the Pope, he was dressed in white. And I also noticed that his Pope mobile was white. And then I saw a picture of his helicopter and it was white. And I saw a picture of his jet airplane and it was white. And I thought, you know, if he had a horse, I think I know what color it would be, white. Well, then I looked at the rest of the things. So he has a bow, he has a weapon, but he's not firing live ammunition. He fights wars in a different way. And a crown was given to him. The popes originally did not have crowns. However, 
I think it was somewhere in the 900s that Pope Gregory put a crown on his own head and from then on the popes wore crowns. In the crown was an inscription, Vicarius Filii Dei, Latin for Vicar of the Son of God. And I'm looking, it fit like perfectly. Then I saw another book called Keys to This Blood written by Malachi Martin, a Catholic person. And I bought the book and when I opened the book, the first chapter said there are three powers that are vying for control of the new world order. There's no question we're going to have a world government. The only question is who will rule it. And there are only three powers with the necessary structure and power to rule a world government, capitalism, communism, and Catholicism. And it perfectly agreed with Paul Blanchard's book, which was written 40 years before then. I was stunned. I also knew I was on to something. Well, if you would like to hear the rest of this message and you're only listening to a half hour today, we have actually a video called Islam in Bible Prophecy. Also, this lesson is one of our lessons in our 14 lesson series called Understanding the End Time. Now you can see how important this is. In the second half of our program today, I'm going to continue this lesson for those of you that are able to stay with us, even if you have to go to endtime.com to hear the rest of the lesson, please do that. Nevertheless, if you'd like to have your own copy of Understanding the End Time, call us right now. 14 one-hour DVDs. You go through these 14 lessons, you'll know the future. You'll know what's coming between now and the Battle of Armageddon, between now and the second coming of Jesus Christ. If you've not been through it, all I can tell you is you need to do it immediately. So the number to call is 1-800-END-TIME. If you merely want this lesson I'm teaching today, ask for Islam in Bible prophecy. The number to call, 800 in time, 800 363 8463. In Time Ministries has taught countless Bible studies about prophecy. One of our favorite places to teach is on the Mount of Olives, where Jesus will soon return, the Temple Mount, where the Third Temple will soon be built, and overlooking the plain of Megiddo, where the Battle of Armageddon will soon be fought. Being in the place where prophecies will soon take place brings them to life in a breathtaking way. In other words, our favorite place to teach prophecy is while on our Israel Prophecy Tour. You can be a part of it. Join Irvin and Judy Baxter October 27th through November 7th for a life-changing trip. For more details, go to endtime.com or call 1-800-END-TIME. Sign up today. Time is running out. There's a specific prophecy in Daniel chapter 11, verse 32 and 33. Listen to it. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. And they that understand among the people shall instruct many. So right while the Antichrist is corrupting people with his false doctrines and with his flatteries, yet there's going to be a people who are strong for God. They're going to do exploits. And their assignment is the ones who understand should be instructing others who don't understand. To order End Time Ministries bestseller, Understanding the End Time, call 1-800-END-TIME or go to endtime.com. If your station does not carry the full hour of End of the Age, go to endtime.com to hear the conclusion of today's broadcast. I am going to be out for conferences this weekend. I will be on August the 25th at 7.30 p.m. at Fort Smith, Arkansas. I believe that's a Thursday evening, August the 25th. I will be speaking there on America's God-given destiny. Not only is America in the, United States, in the Bible, but in addition to that, the future of the United States is prophesied in the Bible. I'll be disclosing the whole thing to you. Now, if you're an American, that's pretty important to you because America's destiny is going to be your destiny. This has never been taught in the Fort Smith area before. I urge you to be there. I think it's an absolutely vital lesson. I've had so many people walk away from this lesson saying, 
Wow, I had no clue that was in the Bible. America's God-given destiny this coming Thursday, August the 25th at 7.30 p.m. And then on Saturday evening, I'll be up at Springfield, Missouri, teaching the same lesson on Saturday evening, August the 27th, and that'll be at 6 p.m. Then Sunday morning, I'll be speaking on the subject of breaking prophetic fulfillments. That will occur on Sunday morning at 10 a.m. That's at 3010 West Nichols Street in Springfield, Missouri at the Calvary United Pentecostal Church. Let me go back to Fort Smith. On Thursday, I'm going to be at the North Side United Pentecostal Church. Been there many times. 3700 Kelly Highway in Fort Smith. That's Thursday evening, 730. Saturday, Springfield, Missouri at the, well, on the Saturday evening, we'll be at the University Plaza Hotel, 333 John Q. Hammonds Parkway. That's on Saturday evening. Sunday morning, we're going to be at the Calvary United Pentecostal Church, 3010 West Nichols Street. All this information, by the way, is out on our website. Simply go to endtime.com and click on the events button and select conferences. You'll see all this information in great detail. But I'm going to be twice on Sunday, 10 a.m. and then again at 12 p.m. So two sessions back to back. Some will come to the early session, some to the later session. Both of those sessions on Sunday will be the same thing, breaking prophetic fulfillments. And both of them will conclude with a question and answer session from the floor. So if you'd like to ask questions at that time, I will be answering questions after each of those sessions. It's going to be a great time. Now, I want to get back to our subject for today because we want to finish what we began. Now we've been through the red horse, the black horse, the white horse, but we haven't mentioned yet the last horse, the pale horse. Now the pale horse says, I looked and behold a pale horse and his name that sat on him was death and hell followed with him and power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and with the beast of the earth. I looked at that and I couldn't figure it out. The pale horse. What power is the pale power, the pale spirit? Finally, I said, well, it says here that the writer's name is death and hell follows with him. So maybe that's what it just means. So I taught it for several years that the rider on the pale horse was death. And the sooner people die, the less chance they have of being saved, the greater possibility they have of going to hell. And so I taught it that way, but it never felt right. I mean, in this chapter, you've got Catholicism, communism, capitalism, death. The last one didn't fit. I was bothered by that, so a few years ago, I decided to go take one more look at it, the last horse, the pale horse. And I went to the original Greek and what I saw there turned the light bulbs on in my mind because the original Greek that was translated pale is chloros, C-H-L-O-R-O-S. And it says in the Greek dictionary that it means green or pale green. And I thought, well, why did the translators just translate it pale? I mean, chlorophyll makes the plants green, that's obvious. Why did the translators drop the green part? And then it dawned on me. I took some foreign language in school and they taught us that when you're translating, that you always need to make sure it makes sense. And if it doesn't make sense, there's something wrong. Well, I can just imagine the translator who was translating this passage, passage not realizing this, these horses were symbols. They thought they were literal horses and they thought, well, white horses, yeah, I've seen a white horse. Red horse, I've seen a red horse. Black horse, I've seen a black horse. But a green horse? I mean, if you were driving home from work today and you saw a green horse out in the field, you'd probably end up in the ditch. It would startle you so much because there is no such thing. And so the translator said, look, 
I, I must be misunderstanding this, not realizing these were not literal horses. So he says, I'm just going to drop the green part and just say pale. And in so doing, he distorted the whole meaning of the prophecy. He should have translated it, the green horse. Why? Because there's another spirit that captivates the hearts and minds of men and women today that's known as the green power. I was reading an article, and in this particular article, I think it was written by a man by the name of Daniel Pipes. He said, the time has come that the red power has been replaced by the green power as the number one enemy of the West. And I read that and I said, what's he talking about? And he said, our worst enemy used to be communism, but now it's Islamism. And he called it the green power. Well, then I began to investigate and found out that green is the dominant color in Islam. If you go to the Temple Mount today, where right now the Muslims control, every door is painted green, all the rod, uh, iron railings are painted green. If you stand on the Mount of Olives looking over Jerusalem at night, every mosque, the minarets have their lights on, the lights are all green because green was Mohammed's favorite color. And green is the official color of Islam. And all of a sudden I thought, it makes so much sense. Catholicism, communism, capitalism, Islamism. And then I looked at the rest of the prophecy. It says, and power was given unto him over the fourth part of the earth. What's that mean? I went to the internet and Googled Islam. And it says that Islam has now about 1.6 to 1.7 billion followers. And I thought, what part of the entire earth is that? There's about 7 billion people on earth. 1.6, 1.7 billion is on the money. One fourth of the world's population now declares their allegiance to Islam. I thought, oh my goodness. And then it says to kill with the sword. They do a lot of that. And with hunger, a lot of the Muslim countries suffer from hunger because of their poverty. They, put, they don't put a lot of emphasis on work. They put a lot more emphasis on revolution. And with death. And then it says the rider on the pale horse was death. I begin to investigate Islam and they glorify death. I read one person that said, you Christians glorify life. We Muslims glorify death. And they teach the greatest thing you can do is die as a martyr for Allah. Everything made so much sense now. It all fit together. Now they'd say that if you die as a martyr for Allah, you go straight to paradise and you enjoy the favors of 72 dark-eyed virgins. But they're wrong about that because this is the Bible and this tells us what really happens. The rider on the horse was death and hell followed. I mean, how many suicide bombers have gone in and pushed the button on their suicide vest and blown away 15, 20, 30, 40 Jewish people or other people thinking they were going to paradise only to wake up in hell. What a horrible deception. What a horrible disappointment. Let's go now to Zechariah because there's a couple of other things there I want you to notice. In Zechariah chapter number six, verse one through eight, again, the horses are listed red, black, white, and then grizzled and bay. Some translations call this and the fourth chariot, there were strong horses. There are many different possible translations of this. Now, Islam is a very strong religion. If you are Islamic, don't try to leave, they'll kill you. Most of them will. Uh, many pe parents kill their own children if they try to depart from Islam. They are so strong in their belief that this is the only way. And if you're born Islamic, you've got to stay Islamic. So it's a strong religion. Now, we know it's Islam, whatever the case may be. And then Zechariah said, what are these, my Lord? And the angel answered, these are the four spirits that go forth 
into all the world. You see, these spirits don't stop at national boundaries. They transcend national boundaries. There are Islamic powers all over the world. There are Christian uh, Catholic powers all over the world. There are communist nations all over the world. There are capitalist nations all over the world. It doesn't stop at boundaries. These are spirits that are not boxed in by boundaries. But notice verse six, it says the black horses, which are therein go forth into the north country. Question, where does capitalism go in our world? The Northern hemisphere is where all the capitalist countries are. North America, Europe, that's where capitalism is dominant. They go into the North country. And then it says, the white horse goes after them because Catholicism has followed capitalism into America, into Europe. So everything fits perfectly. And then it says, these that have gone to the North country have quieted my spirit. You don't see many great spiritual revivals in the Northern hemisphere because people are too busy making money. They're too busy for God. They're too busy even to have a revival anymore. These in the North country have quieted my spirit in the North country. This prophecy is so incredibly accurate. And we're not going to talk about this today because I'm getting ready to take your calls. But the interesting thing is the next seal that was opened doesn't have anything to do with horses. It shows souls under the altar crying out, how long till thou dost avenge our blood upon those that dwell upon the earth. And the Lord said to them, rest just a little season until your fellow brethren shall be killed like you were. Well, that verse nine through 11 of Revelation chapter six represents those who are killed during the great tribulation. And then the six vials when the heavens open like a scroll and Jesus appears in the sky. So we are right now in the fourth vile era. That's the reason Islam is so dominant right now. But then the next era we will enter into will be the great tribulation period. It's an amazing study. One more time, I gotta tell you, this and many, many, many times more than this is in our DVD series called Understand the End Time. If you haven't been through it, it is mandatory, especially for right now because the end time has arrived. If you want to get your own copy, 14 one hour DVDs, call 1-800-END-TIME or simply go to endtime.com. It's right there for you. I hope you'll do that. First Chronicles 12, 32 states, and of the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. Jerusalem Prophecy College was created to educate the Jewish people concerning the prophecies that will come to pass in the near future. But why stop there? We want to give everyone this opportunity. That's why the online learning portion of the Jerusalem Prophecy College has been created, designed for students who desire to participate in the program but cannot attend the physical college in Jerusalem. With the online program, you can study from the convenience of your home with the flexibility to accommodate your schedule. Jerusalem Prophecy College helps to train a core group of leaders who can effectively minister to others in the end time. The next semester begins Monday, September 5th. Go to JerusalemProphecyCollege.com to register today. That's JerusalemProphecyCollege.com. When we started our Jerusalem Prophecy College in Jerusalem, I had so many people calling me saying, oh, I'd love to attend the Jerusalem Prophecy College. Do I have to live in Jerusalem? And I said, well, yes, that's where it is. And most of them could not. And I got so many calls like that, that I began to think about it. I went to one of our staff members who had taught in a secular online college and I said, Pam, uh, could we convert our college to an online college? There's so many people wanting to attend. She said, I think we can. She and another one of our staff members worked very diligently and they've done it. So now anybody in the world 
can attend the Jerusalem Prophecy College. In that first semester we put it online, we were just getting started. We had three students. The next semester, 25. The next semester, 200. So the Jerusalem Prophecy College has become very, very popular. If you would like to attend the college, uh, like they said there on the advertisement, simply go to Jerusalem Prophecy College dot com and everything you need to know is right there. Anyway, it's, it's an amazing course and you will graduate from the Jerusalem Prophecy College knowing more about Bible prophecy than 99% of the graduates from Theological Seminary. I promise you will. And so I encourage you, if you're interested, go there because the next semester is going to begin in just a week or two. So don't delay. Do it right away. JerusalemProphecyCollege.com. And oh, one more thing. If you want to really go to the next level, then get on the airplane and go to Israel with Judy and I come October the 27th. October 27th through November the 7th, 12 glorious days walking the streets and the hillsides of the nation of Israel, the promised land, no less. Walking in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. There's no experience like it. You will read your Bible like you never read it before. I mean, the words will jump off the page at you. You're going to stand where Jesus stood. You're going to walk where Jesus walked. You're going to walk in the footsteps of the apostles and the prophets. There is nothing like it in the whole world, I promise you. So if you've never been to Israel, I don't even care if you're a Christian or not. You'll still love it. It'll change your life forever. But if you're a Christian, I mean, your Bible, you've been reading in black and white. Now you're going to read it in technicolor. I promise you the words will just absolutely come alive if you, as you read them. So if you'd like to go with us, call us right now, 1-800-END-TIME. Ask to speak to someone about the tour. And we're going to have a lot of wonderful people on the tour this year. It's going to be absolutely marvelous. So give us a call, 800-END-TIME. Ask to speak to someone about the tour. They'll give you all the information that you need. But don't wait too long because we're getting really, really close to the deadline now. So don't wait. Okay, uh, I want to get to the phones now. And Joe is calling from Ohio. Hello, Joe. I want to ask you a question about the uh, the influence of Jews in the world. I was doing some research the other day, and uh, there has been some good things from uh, prominent Jews, you know, in history, like you know Christopher Columbus and you know Albert Einstein and uh, the guy who discovered the power of oil back in the 1820s and 30s. I don't remember his name, but he was a Jew. But there's also been evil introduced in the world by Jews like, you know, Karl Marx and uh, Lenin and, you know, Stalin was uh, related to Jews and uh, um, Adolf Hitler was related to Jews. So why do you think that is? Well, the Bible, the Lord promised Abraham uh and that he would be blessed, that his people and his descendants would be blessed. And then when the Jewish people were driven into captivity, the Lord said, I will bless you even in your captivity. So the Jews have been, always been extraordinarily blessed financially. Much of the banking system of the world is under Jewish control. Whether you talk about the Rothschilds, who is the, that's the largest banking family in Europe, or you talk about the Rockefellers. Uh, David Rockefeller was the uh, chairman of the board of Chase uh, Manhattan Bank uh, until he retired. Uh, so the Jewish faction has been very, very powerful because some of them think that they are supposed to bring to pass the promise that God made to Abraham that ultimately they would rule the world. And so they've chosen money as a way to do that. Now, as far as Hitler and Stalin, I don't think that that's very well documented that they in fact were Jewish, although there are rumors out there, but uh, it doesn't look like that those rumors about them are true. But you're absolutely right. There have been very prominent Jewish people throughout the ages uh, and 
Uh, some of the Jewish people go toward God, other people go toward ability. And they are very ability people, very intelligent people, and God has blessed them. So the Jewish influence is very prominent in our world, and some of the Jews today think that they're going to end up ruining the world from Israel. But they're wrong, of course, uh, because they won't rule the world. They're going to end up on the brink of, dis of extinction during the battle of Armageddon until Jesus Christ comes and saves them and intervenes for them. Nevertheless, those are my thoughts for whatever they're worth, Joe. Okay, let me ask you a question. Uh, I just found out something, you know, that happened in Afghanistan the other day. Do you think uh, the giants that existed back in the, uh, you know, Noah's time and after that and all the stuff they had, six fingers and six toes and all the stuff, or, you know, both hands and, and both feet and all the stuff, and they were, you know, uh, very high in stature and all the stuff and, and very strong. Do you think those creatures can exist today? I have, I have no evidence that they exist today. I'm sure that if we had people with six fingers and six toes uh, and they were giants, I am sure that we would know about them uh, but as far as I know, I don't believe that those do exist today on the earth. Okay. I found out something about what happened in Afghanistan back in 2002 in the, uh, the province of Kandahar. There's, uh, you know, some remote mountains in that province in Afghanistan. And they said that the U.S. military actually killed one of those creatures that was living in a cave in Afghanistan. And that was back in... 2002, and I just found out about that about two days ago. Yeah. Well, listen, you know, Joe. That, that I would, yeah. if you, Joe, if you have any solid documentation about that, I'd love to see it. I do need to go on to our next caller now, but uh, if you have documentation, send it to endtime at endtime.com because we certainly want to see it. That'd be interesting for us to see. As far as I know, I don't think there's been anything like that for several thousand years now. Thanks a lot, Joe. I appreciate the phone call. Let's go down to Florida. Floyd is calling from Florida. Hello, Floyd. What's on your mind? I have a question. Okay. You're have been talking about the seals today, opening the seals today. Yes. And uh, that I've not, I'm not too long, I haven't listened to all your tapes yet, but I haven't heard any, you say anything about Revelation 8, 2, where it says the, the uh, sixth seal, seventh seal, uh, opens the trumpets, hands the trumpets or gives the trumpets to the uh, uh, angels and tells them to prepare to blow the trumpets. Yes, Floyd. I, and you have uh, five trumpets already open, and I, I just, how do you speak to that? Well, because I don't believe that if you read that carefully, I don't believe that the seven trumpets were open under the seventh seal, because if you see the seventh seal, it ends in verse five, and then the trumpets begin to sound. Now, in verse two, it talked about the angels prepared themselves to sound. Now that is true, but then it goes on back and finishes the seventh seal with there were voices, thunders, earthquakes, and great hail. And then the verse five, uh, verse six, is when actually the first trumpet begins to sound. Many people have believed because of the way that's phrased there in the Bible, that the seven trumpets all have to be contained in the seventh seal. I do not believe that at all because uh, the seventh seal, the seventh trumpet, the seventh vial is all the exact same thing. I took three Bibles years ago and I opened up to the seventh seal, the seventh trumpet, the seventh vial, and I read one, then the other, then the other. And I realized at that time that they were all the same thing. So I do not believe whatsoever that the seven seals are contained in the seventh, I mean the seventh trump, the seven trumpets are contained in the seventh seal. I believe that the seals are the long story, but the trumpets are the shorter story. I believe the trumpets started about a hundred years ago and will culminate at the exact same time as the seals will culminate. They all culminate at the battle of Armageddon and the second coming of Jesus to the earth. Yeah, I, I understand that and it sounds, uh, you know, acceptable. It's just that most people want to argue with you, well, the trumpets can't start until the seventh seal opened and hands the trumpets to it. Yeah, well, Floyd, I wrestle with that question myself because that's what a lot of the books taught. 
Yeah. But the longer I looked at it, the more I realized it absolutely could not be true, especially when God helped me to understand the third trumpet. And when I understood the third trumpet was sounded in 1986 and I felt like I had absolute proof of that, well, it revolutionized my whole way of thinking. When I put, went back and put it all together, everything started making so much sense. So uh, that's the reason I believe what I believe. Another quick question, and I'll just hang up and let you speak to this. Okay. You never mentioned the uh, Daniel 12, 11, which says God tells him that uh, people will 12, 90 days or 13, 35 days, which leads you to believe that there's 75 or, let's see, 45 and 30 more days. Yeah. Uh, that does come up once in a while here on the program, Floyd. Thank you very much for your phone call. Uh, I don't fully understand that except the Bible says the Antichrist will reign till the 1,290th day. And then it says, blessed is he that cometh to the 1,335th day. There's a 45-day gap between the 1290 and the 1335. I tend to believe that that is the Battle of Armageddon during that 45 day period. And that's the transition from, the, from human government to the kingdom of God. Now that's what I believe because it says, blessed is he that remaineth and cometh to the 1,335th day. So if you make it through the pouring out of the wrath of God, the great tribulation, you make it through all those things and you come to the 1,335 day, the Bible says you're blessed. Real quick, I will, do I have time? Uh, I'm going to try real quick. Gene from Texas. Hello, Gene. What's your question? Hello. Just a quick question regarding the, the chariots. Uh, I noticed that I was trying to, to finish up. If you're trying to discuss this, uh, the chariots in Zechariah, uh, it, it says that the black and the white ones, they go to the north. And I would tend to think that, you know, the north country being Russia as far as in Ezekiel, you know, you think that'd be red. Uh, and then when I look for what the red one did, the red one, it doesn't mention where the red ones go, uh, just the dappled ones. They yeah. Go south. So I was wondering how you, you know, correlate those two. Well, you know, at the UN today, they talk about the have nations being in the northern hemisphere and the have not nations being in the southern hemisphere. That's something that is a very commonly referred to thing. The have nations are the capitalist nations. The poverty stricken nations are in the Southern Hemisphere. That's the best I can tell you, Gene. And sorry, I can't spend more time expounding on it, but uh, I'm totally out of time. But good question. I appreciate it very much. Gonna let you go. Uh, if you're still waiting online, uh, we have to let you go. Please call back tomorrow. Nevertheless, uh, thanks to everybody for listening today. If you're not yet a partner with End Time Ministries, this would be a great day to become a partner. We've got so much work to do and so little time to do it in. Where there's unity, there's strength. Please join us. Become a partner with End Time Ministries. To be a partner, call us 800 End Time. The operators will tell you exactly what to do. We'd love to have you on board. God bless you all. See you tomorrow. is a production of End Time Ministries. This broadcast will be available on our website, endtime.com, in the archive section. On our website, you'll also find more information about how current events are fulfilling Bible prophecy. To reach our operators, call 1-800-END-TIME. That's 1-800-363-8463. End Time Ministries is partner-supported. We would like to say thank you to our partners who made this broadcast possible. To do what Matthew 24, 14 said, to reach the world with the gospel of the kingdom.